Good evening. Well, this is my first time speaking at a conference, so I hope you all will say a quick prayer for me. <laughs> it's a great honor to be here. Um, although I dreaded coming up here and doing this, uh, it's a great honor because every good thing in my life has come to me because of Our Lady of Medjugorje. So this is a great honor for me to come here and be able to say thank you to her publicly. Just a brief introduction. Um, I'm the father of four children, like he said. I'm one of ten myself. Um, my wife, my four children, we're all very devout Catholics today, but it wasn't always that way. My father is a convert, and we, were from, we grew up in Iowa in the Midwest, and we were kind of Bible Belt Catholics. And the thing that uh, some Bible Belt Catholics have is that they have a strong dislike, excuse Bible Belt Christian, Christian, Bible Belt Christian. And the thing that some Bible Belt Christians have a dislike for is Catholics, as you might know. And uh, all my relatives, uh, my parents, everyone, in Iowa uh, had a dislike for the Catholic Church. So my father moved to California and he began a job in a big national corporation. And in this corporation um, he had uh, uh, for his boss a man who was over the entire United States, very successful man. And he admired this guy greatly. His name was Bert Bride. Bert Bride was a devout Catholic. He had a sixth grade education, but he loved St. Therese, and he loved his Catholic faith. And my dad, although he didn't like his Catholicism, he admired this man named Bert Bride very much. He admired him so much that he would come home and tell us as kids stories about this man, what a great man he was, what honor, and uh, how honest he was, and things like that. Well, one day, Bert Bride called my dad into his office. My dad was worried, and Bert Bride said to him, we may leave here and never be friends again, but I'm willing to take that chance. And my father thought he was maybe going to be fired. So he uh, went in, and Bert Bride looked at him and said, my father's name is Dave also, he said, Dave, I just want you to know that I represent the one true faith. I'm Roman Catholic. And if you can prove me wrong, I'll join your church. But if I prove I'm right, you have to become a Catholic. Do we have a deal? And he put his hand out, and my father, you know, he's um, pretty cantankerous, not one to back away from a challenge. He said, okay, we got a deal. How do you want to do this? Well, Bert Bride handed him a couple of books. And one of them was The Story of a Soul about St. Therese. Many of you, I'm sure, have read that. My father began to read that book. And at this time, he had five children. I was the oldest of the five children. He read that book, and he had never read anything so profound, um, filled with so much depth and love and faith. And um, from that book, my father realized that he had been missing something in his life. So he told my mother, they began to study the Catholic faith, and a short time later, my mother and father and five children were baptized Catholics. That was December 22nd, a number of years ago. Well, then they went on to become even better Catholics and had five more children. <laughs> At the time, my mother was, she was pregnant with number six, and she had already picked out the name and my dad argued with her. He wanted her to change the name to Teresa after St. Therese. And my mother, she would only assent to the middle name being Teresa. So my sister's name was Valerie Teresa. Well then right away my mother got pregnant again and my dad won and so we had our little Teresa. Um, Teresa, she died on her uh, well, she was eight years old, near her eighth birthday, she died, her appendix burst. And it's amazing, she was the most special child in our family. You know how you can have kids and every one is unique, but there's one that's just so full of joy and life and happiness. 
uh, all our relatives would come over there and they'd want to see my little sister, Teresa. She was special. And she was taken away and it did something to my family. My family, um, it was like you took a little piece of the heart out of my family. My mother, uh, my mother was never the same after that. She was a terrific mom, but something was missing in her life ever since my little sister Teresa died. Well, we all were put into Catholic schools at that time. Uh, we went through Catholic grammar school, high school, university. I went to University of Santa Clara. And what happened was we became products of the world, uh, products of our culture. We uh, were cafeteria Catholics. We probably picked and choose what we did, what we believed in, what we didn't believe in. We didn't always go to Mass on Sunday. Although my dad was a daily communicant, even he, from priests, friends, and others, he kind of fell away from the teachings of the church. It was okay just to be a good person. And our family lost its Catholicism. If you ask us, what faith are you, we would have said we were Catholic. But in reality, we were, we were people of the United States. We were products of this culture. Well, I got married very young. Um, like, our, like one of our earlier speakers, my wife was 17 and I was 19. We got married very young. We have four children. And my sole goal in life was to be successful, was to make money. And that's what I set out to do. Worked like crazy, was successful, drove a big fancy car and had a car phone and made a lot of money and uh, very successful. My dad and I went into partnership together. We founded a chain of ice cream parlors. Um, things seemed to be going great. But there was just something missing. And one day I read in a newspaper about a retreat that was being, excuse me, a retreat that was being offered. And this retreat was a five-day silent retreat. Well, I wasn't a faithful Catholic, really. But I decided, you know what, that's something I've never done. And somehow there was a tug in my heart to go on this retreat. So I went five days, silence. And uh, each morning I'd meet with the, the Jesuit priest who was directing me. And something happened to where all of a sudden I, I prayed. My prayer after those five days was, Dear Lord, help me to be a better person. You know, when, when you're not living the truth, you know, when you're a person of compromise. I, I was a person I could tell lies and not worry about it, compromise. I was duplicitous. I, I just wasn't good. If somebody looked at me from the outside, they would think, boy, look at that successful man. He's got four children, a beautiful family. But inside, I wasn't a good person. In fact, I felt kind of dirty. And at this retreat, I prayed, dear Lord, uh, just help me to be a better person. Well, right after that, we began to have business troubles. And the first thing that happened was our big franchise, our ice cream parlor franchise. We had 30 stores. We had a couple of failures, and we had some major lawsuits. It resulted in us having to file bankruptcy. My father lost his home. I lost my home. We lost our business. Um, it continued, uh, continued from there. We were in the newspapers every day. We, we had a real public business in Northern California. People knew who we were. And uh, every day, it seemed like there was an article about my family in the paper, so we were publicly kind of embarrassed, having no money, taken before courts. Uh, people uh, filed lawsuits against us for fraud and things like that. Well, we couldn't get away from it. Even filing bankruptcy, you can't discharge fraud. And so here we were caught up in all these lawsuits problems. Um, on top of that, at this time, uh, I injured myself. I was an athlete. I loved playing sports. I injured myself and had a serious accident with my leg, and I was in crutches for three and a half months. So I move out of my home, move my family into an apartment. I have no job, um, have no, uh, no income, no source of income, injure my knee, and uh, I think, oh my gosh, what could be worse? You know, these lawsuits and then my wife comes to me and she says, you know what, I don't think I love you anymore. And I thought, oh my gosh, I could bear 
pretty much anything. The whole time all these problems kept happening, I, I would say, at least I have my family. And my wife, uh, through all these troubles, you know, it put a lot of strain on us, and she didn't want to be married. So here I have these four children, and I moved out. I lived uh, alone for six months. I prayed a lot. Even though I wasn't a very good person, I still believed there was a God. And about this time, I found a new job. Things started going better. I finally kind of came around home again and moved back in, although things were very tentative. And at this time, it's funny how you look back and you see how God's hand, that prayer that I prayed, dear Lord, help me be a better person. Right after that, everything in my life was taken. Every single thing that I thought was important was taken. So all of a sudden, I run into this man at a swim meet. You know how on Saturday afternoons you have swim meets if you have children, and you go sit and you watch your kids swim? Well, I'm sitting at a swim meet, and there's, uh, I run into this man that I knew very well. He was an attorney, very successful attorney in Sacramento. And I had seen him recently in the bars. He would, uh, he would, you know, I'd go there Friday afternoon on the way home from work with my friends to have a beer and then go home. And I would see this attorney sitting in there, and he'd been sitting in there all day. And he was, uh, fl <clears throat> excuse me, flirting with the women. And, and I heard that he had left his wife and kids. And, and uh, he was just on a downward spiral. And, you know, I was, I, I felt a lot of compassion for him because I almost felt like I could be in the same place he was even though I was finally back in my home. And uh, I run into him at a swim meet. Hadn't seen him for maybe a, f a month, a couple months. And he walks up to me, and uh, I didn't recognize him. He had this look on his face like I'd never seen. It was the most peaceful, content, joyful, happy look, carefree, I looked at him and I didn't recognize him and I said, his name was Dave. And I said, Dave, is that you? And he said, yes, it's me. I said, you look wonderful. You look terrific. What's happened? Because the last time I'd seen him, you know, he's sitting in a bar. And he said, oh, I, I took a pilgrimage. I went to this place uh, called Medjugorje. And I said, uh, a pilgrimage? Uh, what religion are you? And he said, well, I'm Catholic. And I said, here all this time I'd known him. That tells you how important my faith was. I had no idea that this friend was a Catholic. And I said, you're a Catholic. I'm a Catholic too. And he said, well, have you ever heard of Fatima? I said, yes, I have. He said, well, it's like that, only it's happening today. It's happening right now. The Blessed Virgin Mary is appearing to these young people in Yugoslavia. And I was very interested. I said, wow, that's great, you know, be because it always seems like these things happened years ago. The great saints and all the stories we hear about miracles and things, it always seemed like they, it happened in some other time. It never happens now to us. So I was very curious, and I said, well, tell me about it. Well, he began to tell me about all the miracles. Boy, these things turn gold, and the sun spins, and you should see. And I took a step backwards, and I said, wow, that's really neat, Dave. And running through my mind, I'm thinking, oh, this poor guy's gone from this end of the pendulum to this one. The guy's a religious kook. So I thanked him, and I walked away. And I went home and told my wife, I said, that poor Dave, he's lost it. The guy's crazy. And, but all week, all week long, the thought of his face, because he couldn't make that up. That isn't something that he could uh, contrive. And I kept thinking about him, and I kept thinking about these apparitions. And here comes the next Saturday, next swim meet, and I was anxiously looking forward to finding Dave. So I began looking all over, and I saw his son, and I said, is your dad here? He says, oh, yeah, he's over there. So I, I find myself rushing up to him. Isn't that funny? Rushing up to him, and I said, uh, Dave, you've you got to tell me more about these apparitions, this thing going on in Medjugorje. And so he handed me a little pamphlet. He said, you know, I thought I might run into you today. <laughs> well, I sat there that whole swim meet, and I just devoured this pamphlet. 
and all of a sudden I knew I had to go. The thought that ran through my mind was, what if I was alive 2,000 years ago and somebody came to me and they told me about this guy that might be the Messiah that was working miracles? What would I have done? Would I have been a person to seek him out, to seek out the truth? Or would I have just been content and said, oh yeah, maybe he is, and been fine with my life? And I, the thought that kept coming to me was, I hope that I would be able to say, I would seek you out, Lord. I want to know the truth. And, and with that thought in mind, I came home and I told my wife, let's take a vacation. Well, we still weren't on the greatest terms. And she says, well, I don't want to go to some communist country. That's crazy. And she says, let's go somewhere fun like Hawaii. And uh, I said, no, I, I really want to go to this place. I really want to go. And uh, finally she said, fine, just, just go. So I called some travel agent on the phone, bought a ticket, and I was gone in a week. Got on the airplane, just showed up by myself. And um, as most of you who've been there, I saw the sign of hands the other day, how many people have been to Medjugorje. As most of you know, um, if you go there seeking, uh, Our Lady gives you a great gift. Well, on the airplane, because of my Protestant background, all my relatives being Protestant, uh, I had a fear that I was going to offend God, perhaps. And so the whole way on the airplane, I kept saying, Dear Lord, I I'm not trying to worship Mary. I just want to know the truth. Please forgive me if I offend you. But I just wanted to know the truth. So I get to Medjugorje. I'm there three days. And after three days, I was so disappointed. It was beautiful. People from every country in the world, every evening, all these different groups gathered and sang songs, Germans, Italians, French. It was terrific. It was an oasis. But I didn't go there for that. I wanted to know the truth, whatever that was. And uh, so after three days, I became somewhat disappointed. I thought, you know, I came all this way. I uh, didn't ask for any miracles, didn't want, I just wanted to know the truth. And, and uh, I was kind of depressed. So I go to the evening rosary that night. And uh, as I'm praying the rosary, I'm kneeling next to some other American that I met who was, became a friend. And as I'm praying, I look down and my silver rosary turned gold right in front of my eyes. And I thought, oh my gosh. But then I thought, you know what? Maybe they make trick rosaries over here. <laughs> I was a skeptic. You know, I thought maybe they uh, changed color with the heat of your hand or something. But I, I, I kind of pushed it over towards this guy sitting next to me and I said, what do you see? And he said, uh, I said, what color is this rosary? And he says, well, it's black. The beads are black. And I go, no, no, the chain. He says, it's, it's gold. Well, even then I didn't believe. You know, I thought, oh, I don't know, what does that mean? So the next day, I ran into a group of Americans who were talking and I kind of idle up next to them because it's always nice to hear somebody speaking your language. And uh, I heard them saying that they were going to see Maria. And they had uh, a private appointment with her at her home and she was going to talk to them. And I thought, oh my gosh. And all of a sudden somebody looks at me and says, would you like to join us? I said, oh yes, I really would. So we went to her home and it was here. I thought, I'm going to know the truth. You know, you can see miracles and you can see all kinds of other things, but really you see the truth in a person. And uh, that's what I found out how Medjugorje spreads too, is uh, people come home and they have this gift that people see something in them that they desire. Well, I'm watching Maria and I thought, you know, I'm going to be able to tell if she's a fraud. I'm going to be able to tell if she has uh, ulterior motives or if she's in this for herself. I'm going to look at the way she's dressed, the way she speaks. So here we are, and uh, these Americans begin to take pictures of her. And she puts her head down. And the interpreter says, Maria asks that you put your camera down. And I thought, yeah, come on, you silly Americans. What are you doing? And uh, Maria said, you, you didn't come here to take my picture. You came here to hear Our Lady's words. And I thought, well, that's a good sign. So she begins to speak again, and these Americans pull out their cameras and start taking her pictures again. And I was a little embarrassed. 
uh, she put her head down, looking very sad, and waited, and then she began to speak, and she said some of the most profound things, things that I had never heard, you know, things that a saint might say. And uh, I watched her, and she genuinely wanted us to hear the message. She wanted to impart this to us. It was so important to her. She was sincere, and she had the same look as my friend Dave. Peace, contentment, joy. Then somebody asked her, how often do you pray? And she kind of smiled, and she said, well, I've made my entire life a prayer to God. And at that minute, I couldn't take anymore. I turned around. And I walked away, and I knew that it was true. I knew these messages in Medjugorje were true. And I was confronted with the fact that I hadn't been living that kind of life. You know, all of a sudden, when you see beauty, and then you look at yourself, and uh, maybe it's a little bit of how we're going to see ourselves in heaven when we confront our Lord. But uh, all of a sudden, I was overcome with shame, real shame. I was very happy to see or to know that this was true, but I was so overcome with shame that I wanted to be alone, and I went out, and they have a little graveyard, a little cemetery out behind, and I went out there, and all of a sudden, I started to cry, and I never cried. In fact, I always prided myself that all the other kids in school cried. I never cried. I was tough. I couldn't stop crying. I cried for two hours, and I was so happy nobody was there. I cried so hard that I couldn't stand up. And I just I saw how I looked. Uh, and the thought came to me that if I had died then, that the world would not be a better place because of me being here. In fact, it would probably be worse. But I hadn't really made any great contribution, any contribution at all, to making the world better. I was a taker. You know, I, I was in it for myself. Even with my family, my wife, my relationships, it was about me. And I was overcome with shame. And so I prayed a prayer, Dear Lord, if you want me to be different, you got to do it because I've broken every promise I ever made, every New Year's resolution I ever made. I never kept it. So if you want me to be different, you'll have to change me. But I'd like to be different. So anyway, my trip from then on was terrific. It was just uh, wonderful. I saw many other miracles. I met many wonderful people. I didn't want to leave. But then on the way home, I thought, oh no, I'm on the airplane, and I prayed, dear Lord, please don't make me a religious fanatic. <laughs> so I get home, I get home, and uh, all I could think about was I wanted to pray, and I wanted to read, and I wanted to learn my faith. And can you imagine what this did to my wife? She wasn't in the same place I was. She wasn't in the same place I was before. And all of a sudden, uh, I saw with different eyes. I watched, I'd see the movies my children were watching, and I'd say, oh my gosh, why are we watching these things? I never realized before. I watched television, the books, the magazines laying around the home. Just, and so slowly, I kind of started trying to remove these influences, these bad influences from my house. And I tried to incorporate the messages of Our Lady, prayer, very slowly, not pushing it, very slowly, began to go to daily mass, began to attend a rosary group, started a rosary group, and my life, for me, became wonderful. I'd never had such peace, such joy, knowing that I was doing what was right, uh, knowing that our faith is true. But what happened was, it drove a wedge even further between my wife and I. She became so angry that just seeing a medal around my neck, get that off. Why are you wearing that? That's embarrassing. What are people going to say? I tried to put a crucifix up in our home. You know, in Medjugorje, Our Lady says, put a crucifix up, put the scriptures out. Well, I tried to put a crucifix. My wife says, that people are going to think we're strange. You're not putting that in our living room. And I realized how far my family was from where it should be. And it became so bad, so bad, that I knew that our relationship wasn't going to happen. And then one day my wife came in swearing. If you knew my wife, she's a little five foot two, hundred pounds, 
I'm 250 or 60. <laughs> she came in there, had me so scared, yelling, screaming, profanity. She's the most gentle person normally, and she was, she, uh, I felt like somebody, um, invasion of the body snatchers. Somebody had, somebody had taken over my wife's body, and she was so angry, you know, get rid of this religious stuff. Why are you going to Mass every day? You're, you know, you're pushing this on our children. And my wife was so angry uh, that I, I remember walking into, we have a kind of a big walk-in closet. And I remember standing in the closet, putting my head down, thinking, you know, uh, have I done the wrong thing? Um, you know, I tried to be gentle, but even if you're gentle, they know. You know, somebody who's close to you knows that you're different. And I thought, have I done the wrong thing? I could easily, I could easily um, make my wife feel more comfortable by getting rid of all the things, quit going to Mass, take my medal off, do that. And I remember asking God, God, uh, do, I, do I look to my marriage and get rid of these things, even though in my heart I love you? Or do I continue doing what I know is right? And I said, you know what, I'm going to give this to you, Blessed Mother. You're, you were a mother, and uh, I'm going to give this to you. If you want me to be divorced, uh, then I will be divorced. I'll live forever. I'll give everything I have to my wife, all the money, anything I make. I don't want anything for myself. I'll give it to you. I'll give, give to my wife, but I will do this for you, Lord. Whatever you want, I accept. Well, that, uh, a few days later, I had, been going, I had been going to this prayer group, and uh, I had met uh, some young people in the prayer group, uh, although I didn't know them very well, and I had resolved that it got so bad with my wife that what I was going to do is give her her freedom. I wanted to... I wanted to come to her and say, here, here's the divorce papers. You can have everything. You can have your freedom. I don't want to make your life miserable. I'm sorry. And so the day I was going to do that uh, was a sad day. I got up in the morning. My heart was so heavy I could hardly even get to work. And all morning I knew that I was going at noon to get those divorce papers. Well, about 9 o'clock, I get a call and it's from some guy in the prayer group. I didn't know him very well. In fact, I just recently met him. And he said, uh, he said, hey, can I meet with you this morning? And I said, no, today's a bad day. He says, well, I, I'd really like to meet with you this morning. Do you have a few minutes? I said, no, really, today's not a good day. What's the, what's, what do you have in mind here? I didn't even know the guy well enough to even know what he did for business, why he was calling me. And he said, well, I have a message to give you. And I said, a message? He goes, well, yeah, I have an envelope I, I need to give you. And I said, an envelope? I, why, why do you need to give me an envelope? Well, he says, there's a young girl in the prayer group, and uh, she told me that I had to give this to you this morning. And I said, this is kind of strange. So I said, well, I'll meet you at the park. I didn't want anybody to see us. So I drove over to the park, and here's this great big guy, walks up, and he has this little white envelope sealed, and he hands it to me. And I said, tell me again what happened? And he goes, well, there was a girl in the prayer group who you met, and I barely remembered her. And he said, she was awakened in the middle of the night. She has a special gift. Our Lady speaks to her heart. This girl was about 21 or 22 years old. And I said, okay. Well, she was awakened in the middle of the night and wrote this message for you. And I said, for me? I don't even know her. So anyway, I opened the letter. And I don't remember exactly what it says. Uh, my daughter Kimberly keeps it. My oldest daughter keeps this letter. But it said something like, um, My dear son, I have seen what you've suffered. I have seen that you've given your life to good. You've consecrated your family to me. And uh, sorry, I get a little emotional still. And uh, it was the most loving, wonderful letter, if you believe it, from my Heavenly Mother. And uh, she said, have no fear, for your family um, is important to God. 
and God will not allow your family to fall apart. Well, anyway, here I am sitting with this big guy, and the tears just start running from my eyes. And uh, they still do, huh? And uh, I had such hope all of a sudden. So I took that letter, and I went home, and I had hope, and I, I just believed with all my heart that things were going to be okay. Well, my wife, all of a sudden, she, these bad things start happening to my wife. She uh, has her brand new Suburban stolen out of the driveway. It was kind of her pride and joy, you know, a status symbol. When all the moms show up at school, she had her big Suburban. It was stolen. And then a short time later, within a day or two, she's working at our ice cream parlor in the evening, closing up, and two masked men come in. They have the employees lie down. They take my wife in the back room, and they grab her hair, and they throw her down. They put a gun in her face, tell her to open the safe. Very traumatic. And then within a day after that, she's sitting on the floor, and my daughter is curling my wife's hair, and my wife is sitting on the floor, and my daughter's standing over her, and my wife looks up to take the curling iron, reaches up, and my daughter dropped it on her eye and it burned her eye and so she thought she might lose the sight in her eye all these things happen one after the other after the other until my wife comes to me and she said I don't want to live anymore she says I have no joy I have no happiness um, I'm in darkness and you always seem so happy no matter how badly I treat you and uh, I said, well, you know, I said, I get, I get great strength from going to Mass every day. That's just the only answer that popped out. Well, a few, more, a few days further was Lent. Oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. I'm praying in church. My wife wanted to die. She, she said she wanted to run her car into a pole. So I'm praying in church. And uh, I think it was the Feast of Mary, Mother of God, January 1. I'm praying, and uh, after Mass, everybody's left. I'm all by myself. I look around and make sure nobody's around in case I started crying. Because after going to Medjugorje, I cry a little easier. It's, it's kind of funny. I'm all alone, and so I began to pray. Dear Lord, why are all these problems happening? I don't understand. You know, my wife is miserable. My family's miserable. She wants to kill herself. And I'm, I'm really praying. And all of a sudden, there's a tap on my shoulder. And some lady is in the church. And uh, I had just looked around, and there was nobody there. And this lady taps me. I had no idea who she was. And she smiles, and she says, All those problems that you're worried about, those are God's answers to your prayers. She turns around and walks away. And I said, that's weird. All these, <laughs> all these bad things are God's answers. I wasn't very far advanced in the spiritual life, you can tell. So guess what? About a month goes by, February. It's starting Lent, and we're sitting around the dinner table. And even though my wife didn't want to hear about faith, I always talk to my children. I gave them things to read. I would go in at night and pray with them. Uh, if they were too old and they didn't want to pray, I would pray out loud for them. I'd let them hear my prayer to God. I'd say things like, uh, Dear Lord, help my daughter become a great saint and help her to be strong and help her to be holy. And, and I would let my daughter hear this. I'd make the sign of the cross on her forehead. So even if they were a little too old, my daughter was about 14, I still prayed for them out loud. I wanted to incorporate prayer in their life. And so my kids, they took to it, and even though my wife didn't. And so we're sitting around the dinner table, and I say to my children, what are you guys going to give up for Lent? What kind of sacrifice are we going to make? And I knew that would just set my wife off, but I just took the chance. And one, one said, I'm going to give up chocolate, and another said something else. Each one said something, and, and uh, so I said, well, I'm going to do this. And I didn't say anything to my wife. And my wife goes, well, aren't you going to ask me what I'm going to do? And I took a deep breath, and I said, what are you going to do? <laughs> she says, I'm going to go to daily mass. <clears throat> we 
Well, I tried hard holding onto the seat so I didn't fall off the chair. I didn't say a word. I just said, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Well, anyway, my wife, she's tough. She's tough. And uh, she went every single day in Lent. Her life changed. She began to be happy. Our relationship improved. She was uh, just something in her began to change. And so here come right before Easter, and I tell all my children, I said, hey, uh, there's a, a penance service uh, where there's going to be 10 priests up at the church, and they're all going to hear confessions to prepare us for Easter. Would you guys like to go with me? And my kids said, oh, Dad, we went to school this week. My wife goes, I think I'd like to go. Well, my wife hadn't been to confession for... I don't think she'd been to confession since her first confession, probably. And I said, okay. And so that evening we drove over there and I prayed the whole way. God, give her the strength to do this. Well, she went to confession. She went in. Her face was white. She was taking deep breaths. Uh, she went in and she encountered a most wonderful priest. He was so gentle and kind. She came out sobbing. So we're driving home, and I said, you know, uh, you've been given a great gift, you know, and make sure you protect that, because the devil will try to take away this peace that you have now. And she looks at me, why do you have to ruin everything? <laughs> yeah, three steps forward, two back. <laughs> So, anyway, that night, 1 o'clock in the morning, my wife wakes me up, hysterical. Someone's in the house. Someone's in the house. David, wake up. Someone's in the house. I go, I didn't hear anything. She goes, yeah, I heard the door slam. I said, the door I didn't hear the door. She goes, yeah, someone's in the house. And she's frantic, uh, just about to tears. And she jumps up and turns on the lights, and she doesn't even wait for me to go see if there's somebody in the house. She just runs through the house, opening the doors, or turning on the lights. She comes back, and she sits down in the bed, and she begins to just sob, sob and sob. And uh, you know when, you're, when you have trouble at home, you know your prayer is deep, right? I had prayed for my wife every single day, offering whatever sacrifice I could. Whatever I could do. Well, anyway, here she is in the middle of the night, sobbing. And she said, I had the most real dream I've ever had. I said, dream? She goes, yeah, I, but I don't think it was a dream. I said, well, you want to tell me? She said, well, I was back in my father's house. And the sky was blue, and the clouds were white and fluffy, and the sun was out. She said there were flowers everywhere, and I was in my dad's house in his backyard. And she said, I was so happy. And I ran into his bedroom, and I was in my father's room, and all of a sudden, there was a banging on the door. And I looked, and there was this creature outside the door. The creature was ugly, gray, drawn skin. I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. It was so hideous. And it wanted in, and I wouldn't let it in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't open the door to let it in. And she said, she said, the creature kept banging on the door, and I became so afraid, I didn't know what to do. And she said, uh, all of a sudden, I heard a woman's voice. And this woman said, you have nothing to fear, just pray. So my wife said, here she is in her father's room. She looks, and there on the nightstand is this little white ceramic lamb. She picks up this lamb, holds it to her heart, and begins to say, Mary had a little lamb. That was the only prayer she knew, probably. <laughs> Mary had a little lamb. And she said, after she held this, she had the courage to open the door and scream, go away. And the creature grabbed the door and slammed the door and left. And that was the slamming of the door that woke my wife up. Well, for anybody who has an understanding of faith, that dream contains a lot of, a lot of truth, doesn't it? Back in her father's home, she's just gone to confession. 
and uh, Our Lady coming to protect her, the devil trying to get back in. Anyway, she didn't realize any of that, so I waited till the next morning to explain it. But, but anyway, the products of Medjugorje in my life. My wife today, um, I have to tell her to quit buying pictures of Our Lady. <laughs> We have, we have them in the closets and under the beds and saints everywhere. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful. <laughs> but uh, my wife has whizzed by me in the spiritual life. She's the most saintly, holy person you'd ever see. Great mother. Uh, we have rosaries in our home. We have neighbors and friends come to the house. We have 40 or 50 people show up in our home. We do Bible studies and things like that. Um, the fruits of Medjugorje have spread to my 10 brothers and sisters. They're all back in the faith. Um, I want to tell you about, a, about some of the wonderful things that are products of Medjugorje. Ten years after I went to Medjugorje, I took my whole family. I took my whole family there, and uh, they were touched. You know, they had been prepared by me, and they were touched, and my children then led four or five more pilgrimages to Medjugorje. They'd arranged it, and their friends and neighbors and family, so we've gone five or six times, and taken groups of 40 or 50 people at a time and witnessed many, many conversions. You know, it's, it's amazing how you can teach the truth, you can take people to church, you can re have them read books, but they go to Medjugorje and they're converted. It's a great gift. Well, anyway, 10 years after, I was helping, uh, was involved in a Marian conference that was being put on in Sacramento, my hometown. And uh, as we're... Um, uh, I was just involved in kind of a small way, but afterwards we agreed to host a dinner in our home for all the people who had worked on the conference. You know, just a thank you dinner. You know how when the conference is over, there's a lot of tired folks, a lot of hours spent, so we had this dinner in my house. Well, one of the guests at the conference was Maria. So we have this dinner in my home, and uh, people are showing up afterwards, and lo and behold, there's a knock on the door, and I open the door, and there's Maria from Medjugorje with her husband. And uh, she came in, and um, we talked, we became friends, and then all of a sudden she said, she said, do you have a crucifix or a statue of Our Lady? And I said, well, sure. She goes, where can I have my apparition? And I thought, oh my gosh. So Maria went into my living room, and we have a crucifix. Actually, it was from Medjugorje. And uh, Maria knelt down, and all the guests that were in our home knelt down, and she had her apparition in my living room. And it wasn't until a few days later that I realized it was almost to the day that I was standing in front of her in Medjugorje 10 years before. So it was kind of a thank you from Our Lady, I think. It was a way of acknowledging just acknowledging my father my father went to mass every single day since he became catholic many years ago never misses mass no matter where he is if he's on a boat he never misses mass he makes sure there's an airport that has a mass he won't miss mass but you know he became kind of a like i told you kind of a product of the world he started believing things that weren't catholic a lot of false teaching and he was encouraging anybody to receive the Eucharist any time. Uh, you know, he, he just had a lot of, he had embraced a lot of errors. And one of the things he had no desire to do was go to Medjugorje. I can pray to Our Lady right here. I can pray right here. I don't need to. I pray to her all the time. And uh, I don't need to see miracles. I have faith. And he just was stubborn and would not go. And so here many years, 10, 12 years, all of a sudden, my dad says, I think I'm going to go to Medjugorje. And I said, well, I thought you didn't have to go. I don't have to, <laughs> but I want to. I, ju I just want to go by myself. I said, okay. He wouldn't even take my mother. 
anyway, uh, my dad, he's there, and he is present for an apparition in Medjugorje. He's present for an apparition of Mariana. He's some distance away, and he sees the tears running down her face. And um, maybe father like son, he has to get away. He takes off walking away through the fields. And as he's walking, he looks up, and there's the miracle of the sun. And he falls on his knees. And you have to know my dad. My dad is the most stoic, stubborn person. Never shows emotion. In fact, he, he, we know that he loves us, us kids. We know that he loves us, but he would never touch us or hug us or say, I love you. He would never say he's sorry. He's just different. Anyway, he comes home, and he said that he fell on his knees and cried for 20 minutes in Medjugorje looking at the miracle of the sun. And now my silly dad is worse than me. <laughs> I've got a couple other stories I'd like to tell you. My sister and brother-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law had a vasectomy. They had their three kids, and they had their number just right. They had two dogs, a cat, three kids, and a house, and a car, and all the things they needed. My brother-in-law, Joe, I get him to go to Medjugorje with us on one of these trips. He's a cop, tough guy, lifts weights, big, tough policeman. He goes to confession in Medjugorje. And he goes in, and he, you know those, how tough some of those priests are over there in Medjugorje. They tell it like it is. Well, he confesses. He says, I have confessed this before, but it still bothers my conscience. I had a vasectomy. And the priest says, well, maybe God's telling you you should do something about it. Oh, Father, he said, I, I, I don't have the money. I'm a policeman, and I got three kids, and I don't have the money. It's too expensive. And the priest says, well... Let me tell you something. Do you know that every time you and your wife have relations, the devil sits at the head of your bed and mocks God? Pretty tough, huh? It was what my brother-in-law needed to hear, though. He said, he said, Father, I'm going to do something about it. And the priest said, then I will help you. I'll dictate a tape for you to take home to your wife. So anyway, my uh, sister... And my brother-in-law have two more kids. They have five now. And they, they have a little statue out in their backyard. My brother-in-law built a shrine to Our Lady in the backyard. And they have their little kids go out and put a flower in the shrine of Our Lady to say thank you because they wouldn't be there without her. Um, there's so many stories, and I'm going to run out of time, but I want to tell you a couple of things. Uh, my daughter, Kimberly, my daughter, Kimberly, the oldest, uh, she came here to Notre Dame, went to school, as did my son. Uh, Kimberly, she embraced the faith like no one I've ever seen. She is very, very smart. Everything she read, she knew. Uh, she remembered. She, her memory was tremendous. She came here to Notre Dame, going to go into some kind of science or medicine, and pretty soon was taking theology and graduated here, I think, uh, summa cum laude, and got a scholarship and went to study in Europe, studied theology at an institute founded by Pope John Paul. And uh, while she was here at Notre Dame, she and uh, three companions, back up just a bit, I prayed like crazy that she would be protected coming here to Notre Dame. Notre Dame has some of the best in the world, right? But they also have some of the worst, I'm sad to say. And I prayed that my daughter would be protected from the bad teaching. Her first day here, she's kneeling in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and somebody comes up and puts a note on her book bag that said, would you like to join a prayer group we're starting called Children of Mary? So anyway, my daughter and five other friends got this little prayer group started. And when she graduated, it was 300 kids daily saying the rosary, going to Mass. They had, you know. And she was proposed to three different times here at Notre Dame. 
and none of them seem right. Well, it's funny, all three of those guys are in the seminary to become priests now. <laughs> so my daughter went to Slovakia, or excuse me, to Austri Austria, studying in Austria, and she writes home and she says, Dad, I met this guy, he's wonderful in Austria, and I thought, oh no, a European, we'll never see her. And so I said, well, tell me about him. I said, describe him, uh, tell, tell me, describe somebody that he reminds you of or that he's like, so I get a, an idea of who he is or what he's like. She says, Dad, he reminds me of Pope John Paul. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm dead, I'm dead. <laughs> well, anyway, He's, he was a Byzantine Catholic seminarian of the Byzantine right out of Slovakia. And uh, my daughter, who was proposed to three times, ends up marrying a priest now. Or <laughs> marries a seminarian. He was ordained a priest of the Byzantine right, and they live in Slovakia, have two kids now. And then I'd like to just tell you quickly about my son, Jeremy. Um, he came here to Notre Dame, was here one year, and began attending the prayer group that was, his sister was involved in. And Jeremy, if you know him, he was a rugby player and a football player, and he drank so much beer that I had to just, I, every kind of punishment you could think of I did, and I thought, this kid is never going to get it. Very good student, but just always in trouble, always comes here to Notre Dame, becomes active in the prayer group, begins praying the rosary, and he attends a retreat, and some sister, uh, the sis Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, is giving a retreat here, and she challenges these children, she says, or young people, she says, some of you know that God is calling you and you are not answering. Anyway, my son walked out of there, got on the phone, called me, and said, Dad, don't renew my tuition next year. I know that I'm supposed to be a priest. And even though it may seem like our, our household is overly religious, I never tried to force religion on my children in any way. We had never spoken about this. And he said, Dad, I know it's a, a calling. I've had it for a long time. So I said, you know what, Jeremy, let's make sure that it's the right thing to do. I'm going to renew your, I'm going to pay your deposit for next year, and then you and I will spend the summer and we'll go visit seminaries. Because he had no idea of different orders, types of seminaries. So we spent the summer doing that. At the end of the summer, he, he uh, signed up to be a priest for the Diocese of Sacramento. And he's just finishing his eighth year, seventh, eighth year, fourth year in Rome. And uh, recently at the Synod over in Rome, you know the Synod they had on the Holy Eucharist? Well, they convoked the ending of the Synod, and uh, Jeremy calls home and he said, Dad, uh, they've chosen me to be the deacon for the Pope. And I said, oh my gosh. So he wrote a long letter home describing the event. We saw it, of course, on uh, EWTN and uh, have since gotten pictures. But he said he was vesting. He was vesting in the room where all these bishops, cardinals, priests all over the world, there were probably 200, 300 bishops. This is the end of the synod. And they all are dressing in white. And they hand my son Jeremy green. And he thought, green, why am I wearing green? And then he looks through a door that's opened, and he sees the Pope kneeling, praying before the start of the ceremony in green. He was the Pope's deacon. So he writes a wonderful letter home how he got to kiss the papal altar. He got to bless the Holy Father with incense. Anyway, you know, and as I'm watching that, all I could think of was my trip to Medjugorje and all the fruits that have come from Our Lady. And uh, you know, she's a great mother. Every prayer that I have prayed has been answered. She has answered it. 
And uh, it's been answered always not in the time I wanted, and not in the way I wanted, but always better than I wanted. And, uh, you know, I, I hear people sometimes say, well, I can go to the Blessed Sacrament here. I don't need to go to Medjugorje. People don't need to do that. You know, you, you can go to Mass. The Mass contains the greatest prayer to God, and that's true. That's true. But for some reason, God seems to think that we need our Blessed Mother because he's sending her, and I don't have a better idea than he does. Hmm. You know, and I think about... It is true. Where, where did I learn that the Mass is great? Where did I learn about adoration? Where did I learn how to pray? Where did I learn about my faith? Our Lady taught me. She taught me. I went to her school. And so people, I think sometimes, me included, you, you get away from Medjugorje a little bit and you say, well, I don't want to talk about apparitions. They're not approved by the church. But you know what's amazing is when people go there, they're converted when I give people literature on Medjugorje and the messages, their lives change. And so I would encourage you, don't be embarrassed of Medjugorje. Tell your friends, God is sending her. This is the greatest grace given on the earth right now for conversion, for faith. A couple of things. Yesterday's message, Pope Benedict is in Poland. Yesterday, May 26th, his message, right? He says, he's at the Shrine of Mary, Jasnogora in Poland, and he says, remain in Mary's school. And that's what Medjugorje is, I think. It's Our Lady's school. Can I share one more thing with you? My son Jeremy ordered a chalice, and he ordered it off the internet. And it's an antique chalice, a French chalice. He wanted something very beautiful that had images of Our Lady on it. And so he found it on the internet. A company in England had this. So they sent him pictures, and they described it. So he phoned home, and he said, Dad, I found the chalice I want. So I bought it. My family all chipped in, all my brothers and sisters, my parents, everybody chipped in for this chalice. And uh, it got here. And on the bottom of the chalice was a date, December 22nd, the day my family became Catholic. I thought that was a nice little sign. One more little thing. You know, sometimes, sometimes these little things, they may not be important to everybody. They're important to you. I hope, I hope that uh, my sharing these things, you understand. Um, my sister Teresa, remember I told you that she died? Well, my son Jeremy uh, was given a picture by my dad the day he entered the seminary. He got on the plane to go. My father gave him a picture of my little sister Teresa. And he gave him a picture of St. Therese. And he told Jeremy, you make sure you have these two people praying for you. Invoke their prayers, right? Well, I didn't know this, but my son Jeremy, every single day, he said, he told me this sense, says the rosary. And at the end, he invokes the prayers of my little sister that our family would become, remain Catholic, be strong Catholics. Well, anyway, his uh, ordination date was changed by the bishop at the last minute, and he was really disappointed. So many people were going to be able to come, and now they can't come to the ordination. It's this June 18th. So he thought, well, there's a reason. Well, then his first Mass, his first Mass is scheduled the following day, June 19th. And remember how I told you that my sister, when she died, something was taken from our family? We just felt like something was missing. Well, his first Mass is June 19th, the day she died, 30 years ago. So, yeah, I, felt like, I felt like God was saying, you know, there's a purpose. I have a purpose you have to trust. 
And I know I took something from you, and now I'm giving you something greater, for there will be many spiritual children through this. So I called Jeremy on the phone. We talked about this, and I said, Jeremy, I'm going to this conference in Notre Dame. What should I tell all these people? And he said, Dad, the only thing I can say from my perspective is tell them that my priesthood is a product of Medjugorje and Our Lady. Tell them that. So God bless all of you. Thank you.